Abby Ditkin, Ditkin. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's late, and um, I wouldn't be talking to you if there was not something we would need to discuss. Um, and uh, the thing we need to discuss is. this little article here from the New World Notes. Um, in fact, we don't really need to discuss this article because I already talked a little bit about this in a recent blog post and I don't feel like I should repeat all that here. Um, but Completely unrelated to me, uh, James Wagner Au. I don't even know if how he is pronounced. Is it all Au? If you feel like it, you can give me some tips about how to pronounce his name. Anyway, he posted below his um, little post about the Uncanny Valley and. Um, how it's allegedly um, constituted. Um, this one hour talk of one Alva Noe, who is an author and philosopher and um, he, he really doesn't talk about the Uncanny Valley at all or anything close or related to it. So really, I don't know how that happened. But um, he talks about something else. And that something else is consciousness. And he talks about it in a way that is really, to me, rather weird because he talks about it in a way that made me feel like it's like 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 it set us sets us back a hundred years um, let me let me kind of get to the point of what he what he proposes in he proposes that, or rather he says, um, that the way we talk about the human mind is mostly in, in terms of brain activity. We kind of link the human mind to the brain, which is, from a medical point of view, probably very clear and, and very, very useful and very practical. But um, he argues that the the um, Neuroscience, the science of the nerves and um, brain, especially the, the brain neuroscience, is not making great strides towards understanding how the brain works. And he argues that the brain is such a convoluted and complicated and complex um, thing that it is almost or actually impossible to understand it by just looking at its physical layout. And um, thus he proposes something else that is um, 
looking at it in a philosophical way, the way that, that philosophers look at things, um, which is basically trying to understand it by reasoning. That is, you know, fair. And I, I mean, my argument is not that, that this approach is, is misguided or, or wrong or anything. Uh, my argument is rather that this whole fight, this whole argument has been fought a hundred years ago already in the beginning of psychoanalysis. And um, that it indeed is uh, typical for psychology the way I understand it um, that psychology does just what um, Mr. forgot his name Noe proposes and that is uh, indeed looking at the brain at, at the human psyche the mind the soul uh, without taking too much um, physical background into consideration um, the way the reason why I of all people am talking about this is because I have um, a long time interest and have been a long time student of the teachings of Carl Gustav Jung who was um, one of the early uh, teachers of psychoanalysis and is the founder of the anal analytic uh, psychology and consciousness and the unconscious and the relation between both is pretty central to his teachings um, now going back to Noe the way he describes the conscious is by putting this, this thought out there that we perceive the world around us through human eyes. Um, that is a nice analogy. It is pretty easy to understand, but it is also um, an analogy that is not at the core of what consciousness is. Um, I mean, it's true, we, we perceive the world through limited means. We are, I mean, this, this whole problem is at the center of psychology that um, the object we want to study is, and the means with which we study it are the same. The, the object we want to study is the human mind, the human soul, and we can only perceive this human soul through the human soul, through the human mind. So we are at the same time limited by the very object we want to study. And there is so far, and to my knowledge, no way of getting out of this, this um, this hole out of this uh, tight spot we find ourselves in that we can study the human mind without having to deal with the limitations of our own mind um, and the reason why he uh, cites the Awareness, the, the perception thing first is pretty because it's pretty apparent through through the awareness. For example, um, we are limited in in our 
perception of the world by our bodily functions. For example, our eyes have a certain shape and a certain make so that they will produce an image of the world in a certain way. Um, we perceive the world in colorized images that um, give us a sense of distance and depth of field. Uh, the world of a dog or the world of a fly or the world of a fish of a bird is very different from the world of a human being because of the way they perceive the world the eyes of a fish and the eyes of a fly and even the eyes of a dog are pretty different from ours if to a dog there is no color in the world the world is just a mass of gray shades to a fly the world is a, a large and and very fragmented thing um, so the senses the human body itself um, limits us in our ways on how we can perceive this world around us and the same is true and that is why I don't like this this focus on, on, on perception very much the same is true about all other functions that we have in perceiving what is the same is true about the way we perceive the human soul our own soul is limited by our own means in which it, it embodies itself um, I probably have to get back to this later uh, I tried to ex explain it to L earlier and halfway through you know I get this look that I always get when I when I talk about this um, the look that 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 kind of you know smiles and nods and acts like this is very very fascinating and and we get everything um, so I'm, I'm trying to to make a little bit more sense now uh, the thing to, to remember is we are limited in the way in which we perceive the world. Um, now, the, the human mind actually has other, uh, the human, yeah, other functions next to perception. If we were just the being that perceives the world, um, we would not be complete. This is not a complete description of a human being. Instead, we are also the being that feels, that um, is affected by the world. The being that um, has feelings. We are also the being that reasons the world that thinks, the being that tries to understand the workings of the world. And we are also the being that imagines, the being that tries to find new ways, tries to bend the world in, in and tries to, to model the world around us. Uh, into new shapes, into new uses, tries to make the world the way it wants it to, do, to, to be. And the world, in this case, is not just the world around us, the world that we are moving in, the world is also the world that is inside us, the world that is our mind our fantasy, our, our soul. So we are all living in, in two worlds. And actually, none of us live in the same world because the, 
the way our minds work is individually very different. Um, one person's mind um, can work pretty much exclusively through perception. They, they are fascinated by the way things are. They, they find joy and meaning in just taking in the world the way it is. The world around them the way it is. And it is their life. They live in the world, in, in the moment, in the, the things that are around them. Another person might just be, to make a, a diametric opposite, might just live in possibilities, in dreams, in, in imaginations. They are fascinated by what their own mind thinks of. But by fascinated by their their own stories, by their dreams, by what they can think of within themselves, fascinated by by music, by art, by stories that have nothing to do with what is going on around them, or nothing incorporates nothing from from the world they see but everything from the world that exists within themselves the rich world that is the human fantasy now um, what this shows us is that we are not just limited by our human by the human nature itself but also by our individual, um, by our individual uh, makeup, by our, our indi individual uh, being, and <clears throat> the way Jung describes um, this. makeup of the, the psyche is that he proposes that every psyche has four functions. Um, everyone's psyche has four functions. Um, those being Let's make a little diagram here. Um, let's make different shapes for these. Thinking, feeling, perceiving, and um, imagining. These are the four functions that, according to Jung, the, the human mind is, is made, not really made out of, this, these are the four functions that the, the human mind has. They are like similar to the, the bodily senses, the bodily functions that the human body can perform. Um, thinking means that we reason about the world, that we, try, that we are capable of understanding what is going on. Imagining um, means that we can find, uh, that we can be attached, that we can be engaged in the world, that you can find um, uh, re meaning and, and, and uh, reason to actually 
uh, interact with it, that we can become affected by the world. And affection is a, is a very strong force. It is actually the one st force that forces us to do anything. Uh, reason alone <laughs> will will not make us do something. Whereas affection always does us make us do something. Um, perception means that we can perceive the world. We can we can see it for what it is. We are able to 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 take in. Uh, the sensual and um, even the, the, the take in the mind as it presents itself to us and imagination actually intuition uh, allows us to find new ways and find new uses and find ways and solutions to a given to a to a given scene, to a to a given moment, to a given problem or a given uh, thing that presents us itself to us. These stand in correlation to each other, and that's why I I um, put them in a cross here because. We all, none of these are in the same amount in a given human mind. Everyone has one function that they prefer more than others, and the function that is up opposite of this, of, of the one in this diagram, is the the function that they will probably use least and are most unaware of. So, for example, in our previous exa example, we had someone who lives exclusively via perception. So their intuitive side is very much underdeveloped and very much unknown to them. These other two functions are, you know, useful, but um, uh, so that they are half known, half unknown. They can be relied on if needed, but really the main function is the one that they use most of the time. <clears throat> on top of that, we have two directions a psyche can um, point. And um, no, let's make this different. The psyche can be extroverted or introverted. These are words or expressions that most people are familiar with. Um, an extroverted psyche is leans towards the world around an individual, around the human being, the external world, the world of the physical nature, the world that we can touch, sense, smell, the world we can see and, and, and hear and the people around us, 
ex extroverted people are living through the world around them. They are always seeing themselves as an object in relation to other objects and um, are pretty much unaware of their subjective side. The, their inner workings are most of the time very unknown to them. So <clears throat> these would be like the outer side of this circle. The inner side of the circle are introverted people who are uh, pretty much the opposite of extroverts. They do not live through the world around them, but rather through the world inside them, because every person has a world that lives inside their psyche, that is just as vibrant and just as, as vivid as um, the world around us, and is also just as um, much subject to forces beyond our own influence as the world around us. The inner world has its own rules, its own laws, and its own happenings that we cannot always steer. We cannot always um, influence them. And so it's it's pretty much the same as as the the, the external world. Uh, the difference is that for an introvert, the world is the subject, is me. I am the world, and um, the things around me are pretty uh, are of very little consequence, and certainly much less consequence than the things that are happening inside me. So. Um, to an introvert, the world around them does not really not exist, but is of little or no consequence. <clears throat> Every person pretty much can be found on any of these axes and in any of the directions, either introvert or extrovert. Now, the thing that we want to look at, though, is what is the consciousness. The human conscious is a very, or consciousness in itself, um, to, to say it um, somewhat neutral, is a very recent invention in evolutionary terms. Um, it is probably the most recent invention that nature came up with, and um, it is a very delicate thing, actually. Consciousness is not only linked towards perception. Um, <clears throat> in, the, in the video talk, Mr. Noe, Noe made the, the little example that um, we are all the time um, perceiving things, there we are with perception again, um, but not all of them, we are not aware of all of them. Now, awareness is part of consciousness, but it is not the whole consciousness, because awareness, um, or rather, because perception is not the whole everything we do. We are also constantly, for example, thinking about things, but aren't aware of all the things we are thinking about. Or we are constantly imagining things, but not all the time aware of what we imagine. Uh, our dreams bring to light a lot of things that we thought about or imagined about that we were not previously uh, conscious about. 
or we are feeling a lot of things that we are not aware of. All of these subliminal things that are happening with us, with within our, our mind, are the boundaries of our consciousness. Um, <clears throat> awareness is only partially a good description of the conscious because it doesn't quite grasp the problem we face. Um, Jung made a nice um, picture of the conscious by comparing it to an iceberg. <clears throat> with an iceberg there's always just the tip visible above the waterline but the huge bulk of ice is underneath the water level and we cannot see it. Just how big the iceberg is, is unknown to us if we just look at it from the top, if we just see the, the, the part that sticks out of the water. The part above the water is our conscious. The part below the, the water is our unconscious. And as we see, the, the unconscious is much larger than the conscious. That is because the unconscious is actually the default state. The, the unconscious is the way we've lived for millions of years and the way animals and a lot of other life forms still live. Um, the unconscious is unreflected living in the world. Uh, the conscience is very much linked to the I, to the sense of me. Um, <clears throat> because without a subject, without a psychic sense of me, there is nothing I can relate the world to and make it. You know, there is, we need a subject that perceives the world, we need a subject that is aware of the world in order to be conscious. So consciousness is very much linked to um, to the individual, to the, the, de the development of the individual. So um, that previous forms of human existence were pretty much non-individualistic in the ways that um, they were communal or social animals instead of individual animals. We can still see that um, with <clears throat> or it, it can be still seen in primitive tribes where the tribe itself replaces the individual and the individual is is not important not as important as uh, the the community um, it is also pretty easy for us human beings to fall back into a previous state of mind in an, into an unconscious state of mind um, when things get get tough um, when we cannot cope anymore with the world, when we go insane, that is actually a regression to a previous part of human nature where we become more unconscious and um, more or less in control of ourselves. Um, <clears throat> 
What has this to do with the psychic functions? It has to do with the psychic functions in so much as the main function is always conscious. And consequently, the opposite function, the opposing functions, are unconscious, they are below the waterline. Auxiliary functions that are not the main function but still helpful are also conscious but not quite as much as the main function. They are just close to um, the waterline and <clears throat> that's a pretty accurate model of how the human psyche works. Um, so this is a model that Jung has described a hundred years ago and Likewise, um, Freud and the whole psycho school of psychoanalysis has been working with the unconscious and consciousness for a long, long time and has treated the human psyche as if there is no brain connected to it. Um, because of this very reason that we, if we look at the brain or look at the mind as just an attachment of the human brain we at the same time explain nothing and everything um, we, we explain probably the the background on which the mind works but we still do not explain anything that is within the mind anything that is within the soul um, to do explain the soul we need to rely or we, we, we take the soul as if it was an object of its own right and pretty much ignore biological and um, neurological underlying uh, mechanisms and try to see how far we can get by just taking the soul for what it is or for what it it appears to be. And it turns out that uh, psychology and psychoanalysis got pretty far by, with this approach and I was really surprised that today in this day and age, in the year 2012, uh, this, this approach is <laughs> apparently is still so new to people or so unknown to people that uh, they have to be reminded of it. Um, I should include a closing statement here, I guess, but I can't think of any. I guess my point is the human soul is a lot more complex than the way it is described and the way it is um, treated in, in neuroscience. And uh, it is a highly fascinating area of study. I, I probably will spend the rest of my life just being amazed by it. Thank you very much.